Hi everyone, I'm Saskia from Saskia Makes. I'm in the process of learning how to knit and sew a slower and more sustainable wardrobe and I thought it would be fun to document that process here on YouTube. If you're interested, you can also find me on Instagram at Sask Makes. I uh, realized that I haven't exactly introduced myself very well in my past couple of videos, but I am 29. I live in Central North Carolina in Cary with my husband, and we also have a pet bird, Lola. I have been sewing for a few years now. I started with quilting, and I've tried knitting on and off over the past few years, but I finished my first knit it, first finished object in August of last year, and my first YouTube video was um, just kind of a run through of everything I've knit since that first finished object, so if you're interested, please check it out. I also just wanted to take a minute to say thank you to everyone who um, left a comment on my last video or subscribed or gave it a thumbs up. It was really encouraging and I really, really did love reading everyone's comments. Everyone was so encouraging and I really enjoy hearing about your experiences. Uh, the video today will be a collection of tips that I have for other beginner knitters. So if you have anything that you want to add or any other advice or uh, comments that you want to leave, please drop those below. I can't wait to read through those. So I wanted to take some time today to um, kind of compile and talk through how I approach knitting patterns as a beginner. Um, as I mentioned, I've really been seriously knitting for about a year now, and I am really proud of everything that I've finished over the past year. So I took some time last week and just kind of jotted down all of my tips or everything that I have found helpful, any kind of thoughts that struck me, and try to aggregate those into kind of 10 bullet points. And I do have them written down in a notebook, so I will be glancing at this fairly often. I just want to make sure I don't forget anything. Um, and then I have three knits that I'm just going to talk about really, really quickly. I've already discussed these in a bit more detail in my first video, so I don't want to spend too much time on them now. But um, firstly, I am wearing my Oslo sweater today. This is the Oslo sweater by Petite Knit. This is knit in um, the fifth size, which I believe is an extra large. And this is knit in Pasquale Balayage held with Rowan Kid Silk Haze. I finally got to wear this sweater for the first time a month ago or so when it was cold enough and I have been wearing it very regularly since. Um, I've really enjoyed the fit and the yarn combination that I used. I do think I am going to put an elastic in the neckline just because I feel like it is stretching out a little bit and I'd rather mitigate that before, uh, before it stretches out too much. So uh, you'll notice that I did wear this in my first video as well. This is still the only kind of adult sweater that I've finished to date um, and I have really enjoyed wearing it and it is a, a brisk fall date today so um, I thought I would just wear it again today. Um, the other sweater that I'm going to talk about a little bit is this Moby sweater. So I made this for my nephew for Christmas last year and I actually asked my sister if I could bring it home today because I firstly wanted to give it a wash so that it would be ready for him for this fall and winter. Um, I'm also knitting a sweater, um, an Ingrid sweater in the same yarn and my gauge is different for some reason. So I wanted to, um, you know, kind of revisit this and take a look at the gauge and see what may have changed. And then lastly, um, this was my first sweater that I ever finished. Um, I, it was the second one that I started. So I started this sweater and then I started this one, but I did finish this one first. Um, so I thought this one would be a good one to refer back to. I am still really proud that I made this so early in my knitting journey. I'm really happy with how the cables turned out. Um, I'm happy with the collar. Uh, there are obviously a few mistakes in here with the most notable being on the back. The cable pattern is messed up. Um, I'm not sure. Hopefully hopefully you can't see, um, but I did mess up the cable pattern a little bit and I honestly did not notice until I was working on the ribbing. So I decided to just leave it. Um, it is for a little boy, so uh, I'm sure he is not gonna notice. Um, but yeah, really pleased with how this sweater turned out. I 
um, enjoyed it so much that I'm now making a similar sweater for myself in the same yarn. Um, this was knit in, this is the Moby Sweater Mini by Petite Knit, and this was knit with uh, Sunnisgarn Pure Gint. Uh, and the color I think is gray beige heather, um, but it is in my Ravelry and I'll drop the link for that below. Um, so I thought this one would be a good one to refer to because it was definitely a really big learning experience for me. And then the other sweater that I am just going to keep handy in case I want to point to anything on it is my porcelain sweater. Um, this is by Le Knit and this is just knit in the recommended yarn. So this is Sanisgarn tin pure gint and also their tin silk mohair. Um, I very briefly showed this one in my first video but have not talked about it in detail. Um, I will do a true knitting podcast update hopefully next weekend so I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this. Um, but I have finished the um, the first two color work stripes so I have one more color work stripe left and then ribbing and sleeves so we're getting there um i'm so excited to finish this i think it looks so good um it's a really nice kind of hearty sweater so i think it's going to be really warm um and you know once again i am i am really happy with how it looks so far i'm sure it's not perfect and i think my gauge on the ferrule portion is actually a little bit loose which i think is the opposite problem that most people have um but I think it looks really nice. So um, there's kind of a close up of the collar and the color work. Um, so yeah, I figured I would keep this one handy because this was definitely a uh, adventurous project for me when I started it. Um, so I thought that one would be handy to point to as well. Um, so those are kind of the three knits that I'll refer to um, for examples. So yeah, that was a longer introduction than I'm used to doing, uh, but I think I'm gonna just kind of start with point number one on my list. Um, so the first piece of advice or tip that I have is to choose the right pattern and to be really thoughtful about the patterns that you choose to knit. I think it's really easy to get super um, kind of caught up in Instagram or YouTube or Ravelry, especially if you see a lot of people um, knitting a project or, you know, if you're scrolling through Ravelry and you see something that you just absolutely fall in love with, um, I do think those are good projects to knit and you'll, you'll kind of see that in, you know, as I elaborate on this point, but I think it's important to be thoughtful about the pattern that you pick. Um, I personally get kind of frustrated when I watch YouTubers who you know, put all this effort into knitting a project and then they take these you know, gorgeous photos and say how lovely it looks on Instagram. And then you listen to them talk about it on YouTube and they have all of these issues with either the fit or that it's, you know, not a good fit for their wardrobe or it's not a yarn combination that they can wear or the sizing was off. You know, there's, there's all of these issues that I think maybe could just be avoided from the beginning if people were just a bit more thoughtful about what they chose to knit. Um, so I do think it is really important that you pick a pattern that you love, pick something that you're gonna be excited to work on as much as possible, maybe not when you're picking up stitches for the sleeves, which is my personal, you know, least favorite knitting task, but um, pick something that you love, pick something that makes you happy, pick a yarn that you like dream about at night. Um, for me right now, that is definitely the um, Pure Gint yarn from Seneskarn. It just, to me, embodies everything that I love about knitting and everything that I love about yarn to the point where, you know, every time I'm around a family member now, I'm like, squeeze this ball of yarn um, just because I think, um, I'm you know, I'm just so excited to work with it. So I definitely recommend for your, you know, your first few projects, um, Pick yarn that you love, pick a pattern that you're excited about. You know, when I'm working on a new pattern, I think about it all the time. I think I like, I picture myself knitting it at night when I'm going to sleep. So I think, you know, picking something that you're just that excited about is really important and that will help you with um, kind of continuing with some momentum as you work on it. Especially if you're a beginner, 
you're probably going to be a slow knitter. I definitely still am a slow knitter. It takes me many months to knit an adult sweater, which is why I have only finished one. Um, so I think it's important that you kind of have something that's going to carry you through those long monotonous periods. Um, so, you know, if you're knitting full stock in it on the body or, you know, something like that. I definitely lost, um, with this Oslo sweater, I definitely lost some momentum um, when I was working on the body and the ribbing. Just because the circumference, you know, I knit the um, size five. So the actual circumference of knitting was large. It was a lot of stitches. It took a long time to knit one row. However, I was so excited about the yarn combination that that, you know, that kind of carried me through. Um, I also think it's really important when you're a beginner or my, I guess you can do whatever you want. My recommendation to beginners is to knit a pattern that a lot of other people have knit. Um, I, when I decide on a new sweater to knit or when I'm kind of researching patterns, I look at like every single post on Ravelry that I can. I look at every, you know, post on Instagram that's been tagged with that hashtag. I scour YouTube to find YouTube videos where people have talked about that pattern. Um, and the advantage of knitting something that a bunch of other people have made is there's a lot of resources for fit, for, you know, people with your same body type, perhaps, um, for yarn combinations, especially if you're not using the recommended yarn. There's also sometimes really good information out there about fit or, you know, pattern errata. Um, so I do think if you're a beginner and you know you're by yourself and maybe you don't have a like a local yarn group that you know with that can support you, um, more popular projects are better just because there's more resources to look at. I also, when I was knitting this sweater, didn't really understand the drop shoulder construction at all. Um, I just couldn't really visualize it from the instructions. And so it was really helpful going on um, going on Ravelry and looking at people's progress photos and kind of seeing how the construction progressed over time. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, pick, as, as, I, as I've now said many times, um, pick the right pattern. I think that's kind of step one to, you know, having a successful knitting project as a beginner. I think as you become more experienced, you can probably push through a little bit more or, you know, figure things out a bit more. There's, um, there's more carrying you on your journey other than just your excitement. But I think when you're a beginner knitter, you know, the part that matters is that you're excited about what you're working on. So uh, definitely capitalize on that when you're picking projects and picking yarn. Um, that also brings me to my kind of second piece of advice is to really familiar, familiarize yourself with the pattern. Um, and I'm using pattern here to mean the actual knitting pattern, like the set of instructions, but also um, the pattern as in the order of kind of knits and purls and you know, whatever else techniques, bind offs, cast ons that you're using. Um, so I gauge swatch. Um, I don't think I actually make gauge swatches that are large enough to be helpful. Um, I am a little bit impatient and I also am just kind of cost conscious when I knit and gauge swatches to me sometimes just feel like they're using up a lot of expensive yarn. I know people recommend that you, well, I actually don't know what size people recommend, but I know people recommend that you make swatches that are bigger than the four by four um, section that you're actually, you know, measuring or gauge in. I am normally pretty darn close to a four by four swatch. Um, what I'll sometimes do is make it a little bit wider, but then make it shorter and not knit the whole four inches in height, um, which I'm sure one day I'll look back and really, you know, kind of question why I didn't pay more attention to row gauge. I, I know that that matters, but it just matters a little bit less to me right now, especially for the patterns that I'm knitting. Um, so I like to use my swatches as essentially a skills practice. Um, so I try to practice the cast on that I'm using. If I'm making a specific cast on, I like to practice the actual texture or pattern. Um, for the porcelain sweater, for example, I had never, you knit the, you knit the yoke back and forth 
flat and I had not done color work flat previously. So my main goal in making a gauge swatch was just to see if I could do color work flat. Um, same thing for um, my nephew's Moby sweater. Um, I think for my swatch, I basically picked a little cross section from here to practice the cables and the mock cables because I had not done cables previously. Um, so definitely, you know, I think when you're a beginner and you're excited to start projects, it's really tough to pause and take a minute to make that gauge swatch. Um, but it is really important for fit and sizing. And then it's also just a good opportunity to make sure that you have the skills down or somewhat down that you need to have. Um, if you're new to reading charts, it's also a really nice um, kind of refresher on how to read knitting charts. So yes, familiar, fam, fam, use the swatch to familiarize yourself with the knitting pattern. And then something that I also like to do is I like to use kids knits as an opportunity to practice um, some of those techniques as well to practice, um, you know, construction methods to get used to new designers. Um, so if you do watch that first video that I posted, um, you'll see that a lot of the knits that I made last year were kids knits. Um, so they were for my nieces and nephews and that gave me an opportunity to practice um, lace and color work and cables and also different construction techniques. So I, you know, one sweater was a raglan, one was a drop shoulder, one was a circular yoke. Um, and all of those sweaters kind of got me started on learning what I like and what I don't like. Um, I obviously have not tried everything, have not tried close to everything. You know, there's a million more just construction techniques alone for sweaters that I um, I need to learn, but uh, it, it just gave me a, a good chance to kind of start to see what I like and start to learn new skills in a small package. Um, kids knits are nice because they use less yarn, they're cheaper, if they don't per turn out perfectly, like the kids wearing them probably aren't going to notice. Um, they're also smaller, so they just travel a little bit easier, they're less unwieldy, you know, when you're picking up stitches or doing the collar. Um, so if you do have kids in your life that you can knit for, um, you know, for me it's nieces and nephews and I've started making gifts for friends when they're about to have children. Um, if, if you do have kids that you can knit for, I think it, it is a really nice way to learn and to grow your skill set. Um, especially it's just a little bit more cost effective than only knitting you know, full grown adult sweaters. Um, the last thing that I'll say about kids knits is also if you are a slow beginner knitter like me, um, the kids knits just kind of get you through the construction a little bit faster. And so I think you can learn more things more quickly in a period of time um, than you would if you were only knitting adult sweaters for yourself or, you know, adult hats or whatever, whatever adult knits you're doing. Uh, I will say this is also a reason why I am a big proponent of knitting socks um, because I think there's some overlap there where they're small projects that really give you a chance to practice a bunch of different skills and they don't take very long and they don't use very much yarn. So those are my kind of first two recommendations. My third one um, is a slight reference to my day job, which is an accountant. Uh, so I used to work in public accounting and now I am in-house accounting. And when I was in public, something that we spend a lot of time auditing at public companies is their uh, SOX controls. So if you're not familiar with that term, um, a control is basically something that um, is preventative or detective and helps kind of avoid or catch errors. Um, you know, in the accounting world, errors, whether they're deliberate or accidental, but for our purposes today, um, I like to kind of add in controls for myself to either help prevent mistakes or catch mistakes as soon as I make them. So um, the number one thing that I like to do is I like to use stitch markers 
within the rows. Um, so for example, for this porcelain sweater, um, when I was doing this, oh, sorry, my yarn is cut, caught. Um, for this porcelain sweater, when I was doing this middle row, um, some of the pattern I think had a, a 14 st stitch repeat and some of it had a 10 stitch repeat. And um, I did a little bit of math and, uh, oh, and on top of that, I think, the body of the sweater by nature is a multiple of both 14 and 10. So what I did is I added a stitch marker in every 70 stitches, um, which you can actually, so there's my stitch marker. Um, so I added a stitch marker in every 70 stitches and then that way I knew if I wasn't hitting the end of my pattern repeat at that stitch marker, that means that I made a mistake somewhere. Um, so I would definitely recommend kind of as you're working through tricky areas or things with repeats or motifs, try to find that repeating pattern and add stitch markers in. Um, and that way you can just know immediately if you're off. And it, it definitely has helped me avoid a lot of frogging and ripping back. Um, so that's a big one for me. Um, another big one is I am exceptionally bad at um, keeping track of rows as I knit them. I just forget and I am not always very consistent in how I keep track. So sometimes I do it on my phone. Sometimes I do it, you know, in a notebook and then I'm knitting somewhere and I don't have my phone or my notebook with me. Um, but it definitely causes me to have issues when I knit, especially on sleeves. I'm very bad at keeping track of rows on sleeves. And then I get to the second sleeve and then I realize that I can't quite remember what I did on the first sleeve. So something that works for me is to use stitch markers to count rows. And so I like to use these, um, the stitch markers that you can open and shut. Um, so I don't know how to show this. Um, so that style stitch marker, um, just because they're removable. And what I will sometimes do is I'm, if I'm keeping track of my rows is I will clip one of those either onto my work or onto my project bag. And then as I finish rows, I will just keep adding more stitch markers. Um, or what I've done before is I'll make, like if I need to repeat a motif every eighth row, um, I'll clip eight of those stitch markers together and then I'll move a different stitch marker and a different color down that chain as I knit. Um, that's something that works pretty well for me and I also did that I think on my nephew's sweater. Um, I believe that I had to keep track of the rows both for the cables and then I also had to do decreases at a different rate. So I can't remember what I did exactly but I basically used that stitch marker system to keep track of you know, both the decrease row that I was on and also the pattern motif row that I was on. Um, so that's something that works really well for me. Kind of also related to that sleeve issue that I seem to keep running into. Take notes as you knit. If you modify anything at all, which is, in my opinion, a little bit inevitable, um, definitely write it down. Keep track of how long you knit your sleeves. Um, just take notes as you knit because at some point you're going to have to put it down and you're not going to look at it for a few days or a few weeks and then you're going to pick it up again and you're not going to be able to remember what you did. Um, so yeah, just find a way that works for you. I What I currently do is I like to um, pull the my knitting patterns that I follow onto my iPad and then I either use Notability or Knit Companion. Um, to kind of work through those patterns, that's my preferred way of keeping my knitting patterns with me to follow. And what I like to do is use Notability and then I can actually use a stylus. Uh, so I use an Apple Pencil and actually just handwrite notes onto the pattern. Um, take notes. I am, I consistently think that I'm going to remember and then I don't. Um, so 
I'm always really happy when I actually start taking notes. Something that I also try to do now is when I'm doing my gauge swatches, if I'm doing a long tail cast on, I try to write down how much length I need to do the long tail cast on for my gauge swatch. So then when I go to actually cast on the sweater or whatever I'm casting on, um, it's really helpful to be able to refer back to that instead of, you know, starting from scratch and then either having too much or too little. And um, so that that is a note that I now try to write down. Um, and then overall, um, kind of continuing with this, you know, add knitting controls for yourself is just finding the pattern repeat or the motif um, in a way that works for you. So I, for example, knit the pizza pullover for my niece and that one had a lace motif where the lace design made these little little flowers and it was for me it was really critical that I kind of found the repeat and understood you know how the how the little pizzas or little flowers lined up vertically in the sweater um just to continue kind of helping you know when you make mistakes or you know when you get distracted and you are in the wrong part of the pattern or um, you know, mistakes happen. So that's my third bullet point. My fourth one is much more straightforward and hopefully I won't ramble so much. Um, if you are able, um, take advantage of having a local yarn store. I have two that are pretty close to me and I've definitely gone in there and asked for help. Even when I was working on projects where I didn't you know, purchase the yarn from that store. Um, the people who work at yarn stores are always really friendly and they're really happy to help. And they also just have a lot of knowledge and expertise. Um, and, you know, it's kind of in, in their best interest to, um, to help you because, you know, people who like to knit buy more yarn from yarn stores. Um, and it's just such a good resource. Like for me, for example, I don't really know anyone else around me locally that knits. I know they're there. I just, you know, none of my friends or family really knit. And so I don't really have anyone to go to and ask questions, which is a big part of the reason why I wanted to start sharing what I make on, um, on Instagram and on YouTube, because I really do crave, you know, having that little bit of community and, you know, being able to ask people for advice. But local yarn stores are a great place to go do that. Um, I, my first, so my first project that I made was a pair of socks with yarn from Joann's and my second project was this sweater. So I, uh, printed out the pattern. I took it to the yarn store. I said, I want to make this sweater. What do they, what do I do? And they helped me pick out, um, a yarn combination that would meet gauge. They helped me with knitting needles. They gave me advice on, um, you know, I told a lie. Actually, the first project was a vest that I made for my nephew, which was color work. But the same thing happened. They helped me pick out yarn. That would meet gauge. Helped me pick out needles. Um, they gave me really good advice on how to approach the Fair Isle, which I possibly had no business doing at that time. Um, so I have a lot of respect and appreciation for local yarn stores um, and local small businesses in general. Every time we, you know, go into a small business to, you know, buy yarn or we bought a leaf blower from a, you know, a small business, um, I'm just always really impressed with the amount of um, advice and attention that you get from the people that work there. Um, so yeah, I also, for example, on my nephew's sweater, um, I had gone to Joann's and bought DPNs to do the sleeves um, because Joann's was open. And I do think yarn stores sometimes do not have the most accommodating hours if you work full time. Um, so I bought DPNs and I could not get the sleeves to work. I was so frustrated. Um, and so I finally went to Great Yarns, which is the store in Raleigh. And I said, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I like cannot figure out the sleeve. And I said, and I said, you know, I have knit socks with DPNs before and it was fine. So I don't really understand why I'm struggling so much. And the woman there helped me figure out that I was using, um, like glove finger knitting needles. So they're much shorter. 
Um, and so the length of the DPNs that I was using was just way too short for the sweater sleeve. So that was a really helpful experience and I definitely look forward to using them, um, using those stores as a resource more in the future. My next point is to break the pattern into manageable, manageable chunks. So for me, um, you know, for example, if we look at a sweater, in my opinion, kind of the chunks that I would break it into are the back yoke, what is required to join it in the round. So in this case, you know, I knit the yoke, I pick up stitches for the shoulder, and then I knit this front panel, join that in the round. Then I think the rest of the body that's knit in the round would be a chunk, um, picking up stitches for the neck, and then lastly, each of the sleeves. And I think kind of thinking about a way to break the sweater up can make it mentally a little bit more manageable. I get pretty overwhelmed reading through knitting patterns, um, you know, reading through all 10 pages or whatever. Um, so for me, it's helpful to just kind of pick a section and just read the instructions for that section through a few times. Um, I also think it's helpful to break your knits up for like a little bit of goal setting if that is an effective strategy for you. Um, so I usually like to set some goals for myself. I, I never meet them, but I like to set some goals for myself of, you know, I'm going to try and get the back yoke done by the end of the weekend or going to try and do sleeves by the end of the month or, you know, whatever your timeline is. Um, that kind of helps me stay on track and it also gives me a sense of accomplishment when I finish those sections. And then um, kind of my third comment on this bullet point is if this works for you, I would recommend doing the sleeves and the collar early in the process. Um, so what I like to do is at some point after I join in the round for the body, the next time that I run out of yarn or that my skein runs out, um, I pause, I stop and do the neck. And what I did on my Oslo sweater, which I think worked really well, is I also did the sleeves at that time. Um, I think it helps you not get stuck on sleeve island, firstly. Um, secondly, if you go ahead and knit the collar, and finish the collar, it definitely gives you a better um, idea of the fit of the sweater overall. And also like, it just looks a little bit nicer. It looks a little bit more finished and more polished. Um, and then I think the third thing that it helps with is for me doing the ribbing on the bottom of sweater bodies is a long and tedious process. So I think it's kind of nice having that be the last step because you know that once you finish that step, you're going to be done with the sweater and you can block it and wear it or, um, or gift it. So yeah, that's how I like to break up my sweaters. Uh, if you have a different way, I would love to hear about it. Um, I, I've heard, I've now heard a few people on YouTube say that they like to also, you know, pause and do the collar and the sleeves. So I definitely don't think this is a strategy that I came up with. Um, but I do think it's really effective. Um, so if this is something that you do or that you don't like to do, uh, please let me know. I'm going to take a little coffee break and then I'm going to read through the next page of my notes and then we'll get going again. All right, I'm back. I'm caffeinated. Um, so my sixth bullet point, six of ten, is to make your knits shine. Um, so I kind of have two sub bullet points here. The one is to weave in ends as you go. Um, I hate weaving in ends. My, like, the two things I don't enjoy about knitting are picking up stitches and weaving in ends. And I, I think everyone would agree with me on those. Um, so it kind of struck me when I was knitting the Moby sweater. Um, you know, as I was knit, I, so I knit at work during lunch. Um, and so a lot of times I'll have people stop and ask me what I'm knitting on. Um, and this one especially, I would like hold up the sweater and it just didn't look good because there were so many 
ends dangling off in every which direction um, and it didn't have a neckline at that point it didn't have sleeves it wasn't blocked um and at some point i just i don't know i i was like i want this sweater to look good when i hold it up for people so i went there and i wove in all of the ends that i had at that point um and it looked so much better like it was night and day and i was really proud of it um so i think weaving in ends as you're knitting um, can just give you a little bit more like pride and excitement in the project as you're knitting it. Um, it makes it look a lot nicer, a lot more polished, um, and there is the added benefit that you don't then have to weave in all of your ends at the end. Um, I normally try to pause and weave in ends at some point before I finish a project anyways because the last thing I want to do when I kind of bind off that final edge is to then have to go through and weave in ends. Um, so weave in ends as you knit. And my other piece of advice is um, a really obvious one, but block your knits. I, it, I find it truly mind blowing that there are people who take the time to knit projects and then don't block them. Uh, if you're one of those people, feel free to let me know why you're one of those people. But I just don't, I just don't understand it. Um, I cannot tell you how much better everything that I've made looks after blocking. It just makes all of the stitches settle and even out and it stops things from curling and bunching weird. Um, for example, the, um, the mock cable pattern on this sweater looked so much nicer after blocking. Um, and even on the porcelain sweater, um, what I actually did for this one, because the yoke was curling so much, um, I actually steam blocked just the yoke, just with like a clothing steamer, um, just so that it would lay flat and I would get a better idea of what it looked like when I finished. Um, so block your knits if you want to, um, but you should block your knits. So my next piece of advice is to just use the right tools when you're knitting. Um, and I do wanna kind of caveat this with knitting is expensive, knitting accessories are expensive. You should obviously um, use what is within your means or your budget that you've kind of created for yourself. Um, but to the extent that you're able, you know, like use the right tools. I went to a knit night a while ago now, and there was a like a really lovely woman who was knitting a pair of mittens, but I think she was struggling because she was at a section where you would decrease, you know, around the stitch markers, and she wasn't using stitch markers, so I think she kept losing track of when to decrease, um, which is totally understandable. But if a pattern tells you to use stitch markers, um, my personal advice would be to just do it. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of stitch markers. I've already talked about it. Um, but I think that's a really good example. Um, I was thinking about a couple of tools that I bought when I first started knitting that I found really useful. Um, the one is that the yarn store actually recommended that I buy a set of interchangeable needles when I was knitting this sweater. I don't wanna like tell you to go out and buy interchangeable needles. However, I did find them helpful for me because it A meant that I, you know, just had more needle sizes in my inventory because that was at a period of time where I was kind of casting on quite a few projects at the same time. Um, so it was really helpful just having different needle sizes in my inventory. But what I think was really beneficial was having different lengths. Um, I do think just having the right circular needle length for the project that you're working on makes a big difference, whether that's, um, you know, the collar or the body. Um, and what I also liked about the interchangeable needles that I was using is they came with little caps, like needle stoppers. So you could take the needle off and then screw those little stoppers on and then your stitches couldn't go anywhere. I think especially when you're a beginner knitter, it is really, really easy to drop stitches and to have stitches slide off your needles. 
Um, and as a beginner, you're a little bit less confident or less able to notice and correct when that happens. So I think just having those needle stoppers was really helpful. Um, so if, if it's in your budget and if you think that you're going to knit long term, I do think having a set of interchangeable needles is really helpful. Hi everyone. Um, so I just wrapped up filming and then I remembered that there was something that I wanted to talk about at bullet point seven, use the right tools. So I am just going to film this really quickly and then insert it. Um, so you guys will see this mid video, but I am filming it just after. So if the framing is different or the lighting is different, that's why. So something that I meant to include in this section is just a comment on uh, using the right knitting needles for your project. So this is obviously going to be like a really personal preference. So um, just because this works for me doesn't mean that it's what you need to do, but I just wanted to give two examples uh, so that I can kind of demonstrate what works for me. Um, this is obviously something that will come a little bit with trial and error, but I would also recommend when you're starting projects, if you are going to a local yarn store, or even if you're buying yarn online from a store, um, you know, maybe reach out to them and get their advice or opinions on, you know, what seems to work for people. So the two examples that I have are uh, my Moonset tee, which is knit with Knitting for Olive Pure Silk. So it's a silk yarn um, that I think um, kind of knits up a little bit like a cotton yarn. I actually have not knit with cotton yarn yet, but I imagine this is what cotton or linen yarn would feel like to a certain extent. Um, so for the Moonset Tee, I decided to knit that using, a, I think they're stainless steel, um, but metal Chiaogu circular needles. Um, so the metal needles are nice for two reasons. One being um, they just, it knits very quickly. So a comment that I saw over and over with the Moonset Tee is just that the actual knitting of it is a massive slog because, you know, you're knitting stockinette in the round for a long time on fairly small needles. Uh, I, I will mention, I actually did not think that the Moonset Tee was that bad um, compared to the sweater that I'm wearing, which I felt like was months of stockinette. Um, I thought the Moonset Tee went pretty quickly, but I was using metal needles, so maybe that's why. Um, so the metal needles are nice because they're a little bit faster. They just don't really cling onto your yarn as much. Um, and the tips are a little bit sharper, and especially I think because these are um, needles that are intended for lace knitting. So the tips are a little bit sharper and pointier and for the knitting for olive pure silk, um, I think it can be kind of splitty and the individual plies or strands unravel pretty easily. And so the slightly sharper needle tip just kind of helps, um, you know, make sure that when you're knitting into the stitch that you're kind of grabbing the whole stitch. Um, so that's one where I find metal needles to be really helpful. Um, alternatively, when I was starting my porcelain sweater, I honestly accidentally bought bamboo needles. I just grabbed needles in a hurry from the yarn store and thought they were wood, but they are actually bamboo. And I did a little bit of a little bit of research when I got home because I was like, should I return these? Do I need to buy different needles? And I saw some articles and some blogs that said that bamboo is basically the slowest material and it kind of clings on to the wool the most. And I think for um, the Fair Isle, it's actually really nice because, you know, one of their recommendations for Fair Isle and for stranded color work is that you kind of continuously spread the yarn out on the, um, is that the working needle? The needle in your right hand, you kind of continuously make sure that you're spreading the stitches out. Um, and that just helps with, um, it helps keep your tension even and it makes sure that your, you know, your color work doesn't cinch in as much. And I think the bamboo has been really nice for this because it has so much friction 
with the yarn that my stitches don't slide around at all. So I think as I kind of spread those stitches out, it really keeps them spread out. Um, so bamboo has been really nice for the porcelain sweater and I will probably make sure that I'm making any any color work, you know, any Fair Isle projects on bamboo or at least wood. I don't think I would do Fair Isle on metal needles at all, at least not, you know, at my current skill level. And as I've been talking, I thought of a third example. Um, so I am currently knitting the Ingrid sweater, which features the same um, mock cable pattern as this Moby sweater. Um, so that's this kind of lattice section. And because they're mock cables, um, to do the stitches, you are kind of doing this combination of knitting two stitches together and also knitting through the back loop of stitches and it can be a little bit tricky and so I decided to use metal needles because partly because they're a little bit faster and I want to get the sweater done before Christmas but also because the points are a little bit sharper and narrower and I when I was knitting my gauge swatch I was having issues where I was kind of splitting the yarn as I was trying to knit through the back loop so I thought that the slightly pointier needle would help um, once again, kind of grab that whole stitch. So those are just three quick examples where I tried to be thoughtful about the actual needle material that I was using. Um, and I do think it's paid off really well in each circumstance. Um, I also believe that the, the material that you use has an impact on your gauge. Um, I believe that metal needles or the less friction a needle has, I believe the looser your gauge tends to be. Um, this is obviously, you know, very personal and very dependent on your knitting style and your gauge and everything, um, but that is just also something to be kind of mindful of. And I, I think it's important, um, which I actually did not do this on the Ingrid sweater. I swatched with a wooden needle and then I am knitting it with a metal needle, but I do think it's important to try and swatch using the same type of needle that you intend to knit the uh, the full garment with. So just wanted to throw that in here because, you know, that's something that um, has definitely had an impact on my knitting projects over the past couple of weeks, and I just wanted to share it and get your thoughts. So back to the original video. Bye, everyone. The other tool that, you know, was kind of a game changer for me was buying barber cords. Um, a, just, you know, a lot of knitting patterns have you put stitches on hold, and I do think barber cords are a little bit easier than scrap yarn. Um, but also, when I was knitting this sweater, I at one point thought that I would be able to try it on with the circular needles still on the sweater. That did not work, and I definitely dropped some stitches. Um, so I think if you are trying your knits on, the barber cords just are so much easier. I did buy a little tin of barber cords from the yarn store the first time, but they were expensive. I mean, it was like $20 um, for basically enough barber cord for like a sweater. So I think it was two shorter lengths that you could theoretically use for the sleeves and then a longer length for the body. Um, I thought $20 was a little bit steep for what it was. And I did see that you can just buy a roll of that like silicone tubing on Amazon. Um, I can drop a link to what I bought below. I don't use affiliate links or anything at this time. And I don't even wanna like recommend the product super strongly because it definitely has a, a very strong smell, like a very chemically plasticky smell, which like doesn't get on your knits or anything, but I cannot speak to the quality of this cord. Um, but I think it was, like under $10 for a roll that I will never use up in my lifetime. Uh, so I will drop that link below, you know, either buy that or go to your yarn store and buy the barber cords that they have there. But just having that tubing to slip your stitches onto is incredibly helpful. Um, I also recently bought a light that I use for knitting. Um, I get a ton of advertisements for a, like a branded knitting light. I want to say it's a Lumos light. Um, and I looked at it quickly, but it is really expensive. Um, I think it was like, 
think it was about $60. So I actually ended up looking online and uh, I think there's a bunch of um, workers that use similar lights. So I ended up getting a knitting light from Duluth Trading for like $14. Um, it uses batteries and it just fits around your neck and then the like the little flashlight pieces can um, can rotate. They're like articulating, I guess is the word. Um, and I ended up deciding to get one that uses batteries instead of being rechargeable with my thought being that if we're going camping or I'm going on a trip, it's probably easier for me to just take spare batteries with me instead of recharging it. Um, so the battery life is about eight hours on a set of double A batteries, but I have gotten a ton of use out of that light. Um, it's nice for car trips or if, you know, we're watching a movie and it's a little bit dark in the house. Um, and I think it really does protect my eyes. I felt like I was getting a ton of eye strain when I was knitting. Um, and the knitting light seems to have fixed a lot of that. Um, I think it's also easy to be tempted to knit in less than optimal light. And I mean, that's when you make mistakes. So yeah, overall, um, you know, use the right tools. Once again, if it's within your budget, um, but those are definitely the tools that I have found the most useful over the past year and a bit of knitting. Um, my next tip is something that I will say, I'm not sure that I'm entirely the best person to explain it, um, but try to understand stitch anatomy. Um, you know, get comfortable with kind of the front and back leg of a stitch and also how they fit on the needle. This might be really obvious to everyone else, but this did not really click for me until like the past few months. Um, but just kind of understanding what that stitch looks like, even just within a, you know, a stockinette pattern, um, is really helpful for a few reasons. It's firstly really helpful for, um, counting rows. As I mentioned, I am not the best at counting or keeping track of rows as I knit them. And I used to not really understand how to count rows from the actual kind of fabric that's been knitted, but... Now that that has clicked for me, it's a little bit easier for me to, you know, for example, on this porcelain sweater, I need to knit a certain number of stitches in the main color before I start the next color work row. And it's a lot easier for me now to kind of look at this fabric, like, you know, this, I don't know what you call it, look at the fabric and actually count how many rows I've knit. So try to get comfortable with stitch anatomy for just for counting rows it seems really i'm sure it's really obvious if you're experienced but this this is something that i struggled with for a long time and that finally clicked and the other thing that it's helpful with is when you're picking up stitches um and i'm specifically thinking about the kind of drop shoulder construction that i like to knit um this still is not perfect and it's not seamless but this is where I picked up stitches for the shoulder and because I kind of understood where to pick the stitches up from in the not yeah in the cast on edge um, it meant that I have a more seamless transition to the shoulder piece that comes over um, so yeah that line there is the cast on edge um, and then where it kind of turns up is where I actually picked up the stitches um, and I am really happy with how, with how this looks. Um, it's not perfect, but it was the first time for me that I really kind of understood how to do that properly. And I did the same thing on the Moonset tee that I'm working on. So I was able to kind of implement that on both sweaters. I have not gone back and looked at that same edge on this sweater, um, but I'm sure it's not not nearly as neatly done. Um, so yeah, understanding the stitch anatomy is really helpful for that. And the last place that it's helpful, or I'm sure there's many places that it's helpful, but the last one that stuck out to me was if you are laddering down to fix mistakes. Um, so on my nephew's sweater, I don't know why, but I like really struggled with this section of it. 
Um, so you kind of have, you have two rows of twisted stitches, two, you have a column of twisted stitches, then a garter section, and then another column of twisted stitches. And I kept forgetting to, or I don't know if they're called twisted stitches, but where you knit through the back loop, and I kept forgetting to knit through the back loop on those. Um, but I looked on YouTube how to ladder down and how to fix those mistakes. Um, and that made, I, th I personally think, a big difference for how this sweater looked at the end of the day. Um, you know, there's, there's still a few mistakes, but I think I caught most of them except for that section on the mock cables on the back that I showed. Um, so for this one, it was really helpful, A, just to know how to ladder down. And if you don't know how to do that, I recommend that you learn. I, Very Pink Knits is kind of my go-to YouTube channel for learning anything. She has incredible tutorials on anything that I've ever tried to look up. And she does these like slow motion videos where she, um, something I struggle with when I'm trying to learn how to do things on YouTube, on YouTube is a lot of times people knit so quickly that I cannot follow what they're doing. And I also hold my yarn in my right hand. So I think I'm a thrower most of the time. Um, a lot of experienced knitters are pickers. So they hold the yarn in their left hand left hand. And so when I'm watching YouTube videos of how to do things, it's very hard for me to translate what someone who holds their yarn with their left hand is doing to what I'm trying to do. I think I'm getting better at that, but that is something that I found incredibly difficult when I was new. And so Very Pink Knits does these tutorials where she kind of slows everything down a lot and it's just much easier to follow. So she has great tutorials on how to ladder and fix mistakes. So I would definitely recommend um, giving those a look. And then there is a knitting tool that is really helpful for this. So I'm gonna grab mine and then try to show it to you. So I will be right back. Okay, I'm back. Um, so I don't remember buying this little kit to be honest um i think i bought it just to have a cable needle actually um i don't i don't even think i bought it for this tool but um and this the brand is susan bates and this is just from um joanne's i think and this tool is called a handy tool so it says handy tool great for picking up drop stitches okay there we go so it's basically a crochet hook, except it's pointy at the end. Um, and the little hook is quite, quite small. Um, okay, sorry, I'm having trouble getting the camera to focus on this. So it's a crochet hook, it's pointy on the end. Maybe I can just insert a photo of it. Um, and this thing saved my life when I was making the, um, this sweater. Um, so I think I actually, we were flying to Santa Barbara for a wedding and we were at the airport and I screwed something up. I messed something up and I watched a video and someone used this tool and I was like, I think I, I think I saw that in my knitting bag. Like, I think I own that. And then I used it so many times from there on out. Um, so this tool is nice because it's kind of double ended. And so it's really easy to fix stitches from the knit side and the purl side and it was also really helpful for um fixing stitches that were knit through the back loop or that needed to be knit through the back loop and were not um so i would definitely recommend this tool um handy tool and i think if you don't have access to one of these i think a regular crochet hook would also be would also be very beneficial um so yeah, that was point number eight. Try to understand stitch anatomy. Um, like I said, I don't think I am quite the right person to explain it at this time, but it has vastly improved my knitting experience the more comfortable I've gotten with that. 
Uh, up next is fixing mistakes as they happen. Um, I think there's this, or for me, I should not speak for everyone, but I get kind of impatient when I'm knitting or especially when I'm sewing. I am an extremely impatient sewer for some reason and I just want to get things done so I can wear them and I think it's really important when you make mistakes or when you're not happy with how something looks, fix it immediately. Um, I think like I know some people like to let projects sit when that happens or they put them in timeout or whatever. I actually think you should fix it like right when it happens um, because for me mentally if I know that something is waiting on me to pick up stitches or to fix something I just I put it off kind of indefinitely. Um, so it's definitely it's better for me to just do it immediately like before I even have time to think about it. Just go ahead and frog it or go ahead and seam rip it, you know, whatever. Um, and I think the whole idea of, or not the whole idea, for me, part of the intent behind knitting and sewing my own clothing is to make it more sustainable and to get away from fast fashion and to make things that I want to wear for, for years. And I think especially sweaters like this, I think are kind of, you know, heirloom quality sweaters. And I think to leave mistakes in that you know are there is results in short-term gratification because you can move on to the next step but it, it's just not fun you know when you're finished and then you just know that that mistake is there um even you know this mock cable section that I messed up on this sweater and had I noticed sooner I truly would have gone back and fixed it um but every time I look at this sweater I I know that it's there it doesn't bother me but I know that it's there. Um, I do know there's a, I think there's a saying, and maybe one of you can kind of tell me the history of this saying, but I do know that um, you, what is it? You need to leave a small mistake so that your soul can escape. Let me, let me look it up really quickly. Okay, well, I can't pull up the whole article. So I think there's a few different versions of this superstition, but per Google, um, it is said that you leave a bit of your soul and everything you crochet. This is crochet. It is said that you leave a bit of your soul and everything you crochet. To avoid this, you should always work in a hidden mistake so that your soul can escape. So we're gonna say that's what this mistake is. Um, all that aside, if you make mistakes or if you're not happy with the fit, just fix it. Um, I, for example, when I was doing the bind off on the sleeves of my nephew's sweater, for some reason I thought that I would just remember how to do an Italian tubular bind off. So I tried to do it from memory and I finished one and I kept looking at it and it was completely flared out. Um, like it looked so bad and luckily I had done the body first and I had done the body correctly. Um, so I was looking at the sleeve and I was looking at the body and I was like, I don't understand why one looks so bad and the other one looks so good. Um, and then I finally did actually go back and watch a video and I realized that I had forgotten to slip one of the stitch. I think I forgot to slip the, like the first stitch that you slip off the needle. I hadn't done that. So I had just done it incorrectly. Um, and I decided to kind of undo the bind off and rip it back a couple rows and then redo it and it looked so much better and I'm so happy that I took the time to fix it. Um, so yeah, knitting is temporary, the finished projects are forever, so um, fix your mistakes as you go and I think it just will make you a lot happier with the final product. Um, and then my last tip or piece of advice that I have is extremely cliche, so apologies, but don't be scared to try new things. Um, I personally think of myself as a moderately adventurous knitter. Um, I, you know, you can always be more bold or be more adventurous. Uh, I obviously have not tried, like, I would love to try pattern designing at some point, but you know, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'll get there one day. Um, so 
yeah, but either way, I think of myself as a moderately adventurous knitter. I'm really happy with all of the new things that I've tried in the past year. Um, so I would really recommend if there's something that you want to make or you want to try, just go for it. Uh, you know, use common sense, be logical, go slowly, um, use some of these other tips that I've listed if you want to. Um, the main one being looking at Ravelry and looking at Instagram and reading everyone else's advice on those projects. But if there's something you really want to make, jump in, try it. Uh, you know, at worst, you learn something. At best, you have a new knit that you're really proud of. Um, that being said, work on the right project at the right time. Um, a lot of times when I make mistakes in my knitting, it's because I um, am knitting on the wrong project, at, or I'm knitting on a project at the wrong time. So for example, I'm trying to do, you know, a lace, a new lace motif when I'm talking to friends, or um, I will sometimes bring my knitting with me when we like go out to a bar, and you know, you're a couple beers in, knitting cables, um, that's when you make mistakes, right? So I think it's really good to have a, a few mindless projects on the needles where you're doing endless stockinette or a, you know, a motif you're really comfortable with. And then it's good to have a few more challenging projects so that they're more engaging, but you know, maybe work on those when you have some quiet alone time and when you won't be distracted. Um, so be adventurous, but do work on those projects at the right time. Um, it is really discouraging when you make a lot of mistakes and I think that's kind of an easy way to um, to lose track of your knitting when you're a beginner is by making a lot of mistakes and then getting frustrated and not wanting to, to continue or wanting to finish. Um, and then be adventurous, but also use some common sense with the patterns that you pick or the yarn composition or the yarn color. Um, if you don't, for, so f as an example, um, I have seen some videos where knitters use cotton yarn as their like very first project. Um, cotton yarn and silk yarn are just, they're kind of difficult to knit with. They show mistakes really easily. They slip off your needles easily. The ends are hard to weave in. Um, so like if you're new, like don't have your very first project be cotton yarn, for example. Um, you know, think, be, be a little bit thoughtful about the yarn colors that you use. If you, um, if you know you're not gonna wear a certain color or a certain type of yarn or fiber, maybe just don't know with it, you know, take, take a second, pause, Think about whether this fits in with your wardrobe or if it's a gift knit, you know, with what that person likes. Um, but, you know, don't limit yourself too much and have fun. Um, okay, those are my 10 official kind of little categories of tips for other beginner knitters. Um, I do have a bonus tip that I was thinking about this morning. I definitely got a little bit carried away over the past year with gift knits and um, like gift quilts and sewing projects for other people. Um, I think when you are learning how to knit and you're finally comfortable and you finally finish that first project, it's so easy to kind of take on a lot of projects for other people because you're excited and you want to share your craft and um, you know, you kind of want to spread that knitting joy. Um, I would just be kind of cautious and mindful of how many gifts you take on. I definitely hit a point in August where I felt like all of my time was going towards um, projects for other people. There's two quilts that I'm working on right now for my nieces that are just dragging out. Um, and when you do that, I think it can become a little discouraging because you don't have time to work on your own projects. And then you also, or I at least, feel a lot of guilt when I am not finishing things or not finishing things quickly enough. Or, um, you know, if I 
if I tell someone I'm knitting a sweater for your for your daughter and then it takes time to knit that sweater I feel guilty when I'm not working on it um, so I you know I love making things for other people it, it really does make me very happy I enjoy spreading my you know my knitting um, I do like making knits for uh, kids and for my nieces and nephews but I would just be cautious with how many gift knits you take on because it does eat up a lot of your time um, and I think it's easy to you know feel stressed and overwhelmed and um, for a lot of people knitting is meant to be kind of a relief from feeling stressed and overwhelmed so just be mindful protect your mental space um, and make sure that you're finding time to knit for yourself if that is something that you want to do um, okay those are all of my tips I have no idea how long I've been talking for I I'm sure I rambled a little bit but if you're still here thank you so much for listening if you have any tips for beginners I would love to hear them um, I definitely still consider myself to be a beginner knitter I um, you know I am proud of what I've tried but I think there's some kind of fundamental gaps of knowledge that I have um, I think for me the main thing that I just truly don't understand still is yarn weights and when you're looking at yarn in a yarn store how to translate the yarn weights to the actual gauge of a sweater that you might be knitting um so that's like you know the next thing that i would like to get a better handle on um so if you have any advice or tips for me there i would really love to hear them i am going to spend this afternoon Finishing the sleeve on my moonset tee. I'm about a third of the way through, uh, so I'm really excited to get that sweater finished. So I'm hoping to film a more traditional podcast episode next weekend if possible, and so I will hopefully have a new moonset tee to show you, along with uh, some progress on my porcelain sweater and also the Ingrid sweater that I have cast on. Um, so yeah, that's what I have planned and I will hopefully have some sewing projects to show you soon as well. Um, if you are in the northern hemisphere, I hope you're having a really lovely fall day and enjoying the beautiful weather that we're having. If you're in the southern hemisphere, uh, enjoy the start of your spring. Um, and it was really nice sitting down and spending this time with you. Uh, I hope to see you soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>